see how much lag we can get from Australia uh, out to the outside world this time around. Okay. Okay. That's good. Just need to get my audio out so I can hear in the headphones here now. <laughs> hey, Shalom. Good to see you there. Ooh. You got four or five seconds of lag. It's always a bit interesting with the uh, the lag from here to Australia to get <laughs> yeah, like you need a distraction. Oh, it's still on the Mega 65, so it's on topic, right? Okay, so um, welcome along to those who are uh, watching uh, live, which actually is just challenging at the moment, but uh, I hope a few others might come along as we go along. Um, and otherwise, those of you who are uh, watching along uh, on, uh, on on YouTube, really, uh, once this has been recorded and uploaded, uh, we're just doing a, a bit different for the monthly update this month. So this is June 2021. Uh, while the folks in uh, on the German side are, are pretty busy getting everything organized, uh, I've got a, a little bit of time here tonight, so uh, you get straight from the uh, uh, the engineering desk, so to speak, uh, of the Mega 65. We'll talk a little bit about and brought too. Hey, Tago, welcome along. Yep, cool. There at work. Oh, we've got five minutes. There's some other lurkers who haven't said anything yet, but uh, yeah, welcome along as well. And uh, hey, hey, LGB. Um, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll go through. So you can see we've got a little bit of a, a rough agenda of what I'm aiming to uh, uh, to cover through. Uh, but really, this is going to be uh, pretty casual. Uh, and if anyone has any other uh, questions or anything else, then uh, yeah, uh, let me know as we go along, and I'll do my best uh, to answer those. So uh, the first one we have on the list is the. Um, hibernated one so this is one of the first if not the first game to actively target the mega 65 so it's an infocom text adventure style uh, kind of game uh, but what's really nice is that they're actually making uh, a mega 65 hardware viable so you actually get the a, a three and a half inch floppy disk uh, so you know you actually get a, a, a real disc that you can stick into the uh, uh, the real drive on the Mega 65. We'll talk about that a little bit later in the uh, uh, the video as well about uh, progress on the floppy drive. And yeah, uh, we'll chuck that. Hey Anton, welcome along as well. Uh, and actually, before we get any further, how's the audio level? Is uh, Parallax too loud in the background? Too quiet? Am I too loud? Too quiet? Or we got the audio levels uh, under control now? How are people going for the audio level? Nicely mixed, cool, okay. Um, Cause yeah, I can't easily mix it, uh, hear it back myself. It's one downside to the way I've got the, uh, the setup here at the moment. Uh, cool, okay, so that's hibernated. Uh, then let's go back to our, uh, our list. So that's uh, number one off the list. Uh, number two, this is actually only freshly discovered uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, that um, SY2002 realized that the card detect line for the internal uh, micro SD slots, so the Mega 65 has uh, two uh, SD card slots, a full size SD card slot internally uh, and a micro SD card slot at the back. So we might actually, I can show you. Uh, here's one we prepared earlier. Uh, so this is my Mega 65 uh, on the bench that I actively use. Uh, and so you can see here's the full size SD card and I've got a couple of spares that I interchange and we'll, we'll switch a couple of those out in a moment for the Game Boy. Uh, and then at the back here there's the uh, the micro SD slot. Let's see if I might even be able to telephoto in. So you can see the, uh, the SD card slot uh, a bit bigger here. So this top piece of metal uh, should be earthed on the um, uh, on the, the board but it's not <laughs> so it's soldered down uh, but it's not earthed so the card detect line actually just connects to that shell it doesn't actually connect to any other pin uh, and so uh, it's floating and, and so when you try and detect whether the card there or not uh, you actually can't tell uh, whether it is or not 
So the fix for that, uh, and Anton's actually tested it on his, so we, uh, Anti was actually really good and uh, looked into this and gave us a great solution quite quickly. Where we have these uh, solder pads uh, on the corners, what, you get a, uh, a, a pointing wand. Uh, so we have these pads here on the, uh, the corners and on this side as well. And so the ground plane actually covers most of the PCB. You can see around this area it's solid kind of green. So there's some tracks up here so we wouldn't be able to do anything there. But down here it's all just ground plane. So if you actually just etch off some of that uh, solder mask that's providing insulation uh, on the top of the circuit board there, uh, put a big blob of solder to join it together, uh, that actually will fix the problem. Um, or you could run a short wire from there actually to where this screw mount comes on. There's a uh, earth available under there, or there's earth available on uh, one of these resistors back here as well. I can't remember which side. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, so actually, yes, yeah, so, so Anton actually provided me with a picture. Now, the trick is, can I get that easily up here to? show you that was in did you send that in skype yes you did send it in skype so let me try and get that if i go save i want to have a look where's the Let's do that. Okay. So let me try that. Right there. Oh. So this is Anton said he's fixed uh, just today, a couple of hours ago. So you can see here he's uh, scratched off. Uh, some of the, the coding. So this would apply to all the dev kit machines. So if anyone has a dev kit and they want to do this modification, uh, they can. Uh, and then just put a big blob of solder that bridges the edge of that uh, you know, the, the foot that comes out from the uh, uh, the SD card slot onto the uh, the solder mask on the top layer of the board, uh, and, and that should fix that problem. And we'll actually probably then update at some point uh, the hypervisor code to actually actively check uh, which SD card slots have something inserted uh, rather than at the moment it just tries to reset the card and guess which adds a little bit of uh, uh, extra time. As you, you can see here because this is Anton's machine he's got uh, the stereo speakers fitted, uh, the optional speakers uh, fitted into the case there. Uh, we need to improve the drivers for those they kind of uh, they get really hot because the high frequency uh, signal is not being filtered out but that's uh, that's for another day. So let's go back to where we're up to. So that was the minor PCB uh, fix. So the next piece of exciting news that we have is that the Game Boy Color Core is now actually working really nicely and works with, <coughs> pardon me, uh, digital video output. So it'll be compatible with uh, HDMI monitors. And we'll talk about how we can test that Actually, once we have it up and running, we'll pull up the um, uh, the HDMI analyzer uh, and show you how we've actually verified the HDMI compatibility of the Mega 65's digital video output. Uh, so I need to find where I've put the bitstream for that. And I could put the uh, the link up there to Auntie's web um, site that shows that PCB fix, which is really good. Uh, uh, base box on the other side, uh, Shallon, uh, suggesting uh, with the speakers. Actually, those speakers, uh, and actually, what the, the lugs on the Mega 65 case are uh, designed to take. If I zoom back out on mine, we can see down here. So there's one pair here and another pair here. Uh, so it's the same speakers as what we have on the uh, the Megaphone prototype. They're really nice little speakers, only five mils thick and 40 mil diameter. Uh, but they have quite good tone and for, uh, for SID chip music, they sound fantastic and that they can do 104 decibels or something at full uh, output power. And the Mega 65's amplifier, uh, in theory, can actually deliver that much juice into them. Uh, so, where were we? We were back 
that's the right Game Boy Core. So I need to find where I've put the bit string for that. That's right, it's in a, here we are in my other cause directory. Now I may not be running the absolute latest version of this. Hopefully I have the correct one. So this is loading the bitstream onto the um, uh, thing. Oh, and it's complaining, right, because uh, we, I haven't put the right SD card slot in, SD card rather into the slot. Um, I actually need to reformat uh, my main Mega 65 one, the file system's got a bit corrupt on it and so uh, nothing else wants to put files on it. Uh, so I think this is the correct one. And we'll just reset that again. Yeah, that's right. So as Anton has just said, these these little speakers, they're super thin and they actually fit in the case with the keyboard shut and everything. It's all designed uh, to do that. Uh, oh, now have I put, still put the... I can never remember which card I've got things on here. Uh, it might be on the sand disk, actually. Um, so I'm just trying to get the right card in. That's all firmly in. We'll find out. Uh, okay, so. Now, you can see here there's a bunch of keys that will work uh, with this. So, if we, uh, so I can just press any key to continue, so I can press space to start, and so this bit stream I've got here is not the final one, as I say. Um, it's currently set up for smaller memory because it's faster to synthesize the bitstream when uh, we're doing all the testing. So Super Mario Land um, and Tetris, I think, are the only two games uh, that will work on this. But you will see, and I even, because this, no, that's, me go. I'm, it'll be interesting to see, so I'm just going to, hopefully, we will get sound through this. So if I have the joystick plugged into the right now I'm not sure whether the um oops oh, here we go um is the sound coming through from this this is going to be a um uh, a good question because uh, I haven't tested the audio coming from the uh, the Mega 65 into the HDMI but we can see that the this is it will take my uh, lack of ability of playing the game that this uh, works really nicely oh we can get the mushroom there we go. and so this is actually really exciting because this is going to be you know there's stacks of games uh, that whoops, that this will whoops, uh, let you play. Um, and that, actually, I'm, I'm quite excited about when we have the uh, the handheld Mega 65 finished. That this will be a, a really fun way to uh, uh, to play these as well. So, as I said, there's uh, there'll be more that will be uh, done on that, but already it's uh, it's looking really, 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 really nice. And so this. Uh, is actually significant in terms of it's not just Game Boy Color that this has been converted using the framework that um, SY2002 uh, and a couple of other folks have been building that will allow us will allow them uh, to easily port other cores designed for the Mr. FPGA board and uh, that will mean that you know we'll have uh, Apple II again there's already Spectrum cores and things we have working uh, but there's a whole bunch of other platforms, Amiga, uh, that will come across and be available as cores uh, with this. 
so the Mega 65 really will be as we've hoped from the beginning, uh, a really versatile machine. Um, <laughs> Tego saying, we need a Mega 65 joystick. Um, we have a Mega 65 joystick. Uh, I think on my blog we've released the plans for doing these. So these are the uh, our homemade uh, arcade joysticks uh, that, uh, that we like to make. Uh, and quite happy to, to share the plans for those again and we can provide a, a link maybe Anton can probably dig up the uh, the link uh, and post it in the chat uh, there as we go along in the stream now uh, if he has a chance um, these are quite easy and kind of fun to make at home and the nice thing is you end up with this really big chunky joystick that for adult hands feels about the same size as what the original joysticks felt as a child uh, growing up so it kind of has that whole you know, sort of upsized retro feeling like getting a giant Christmas tree that still feels uh, as big as a Christmas tree when you were uh, when you're a kid uh, which is really nice so um, we're talking before about having the HDMI compatibility of our digital video output uh, and Most fascinating, the, the, the monitor is claiming to have, ah, oh, there we are, that's right. It wasn't coming through, the monitor is coming through uh, separate real speakers I've got here. Uh, I need to, to re-cable all of this so it's a little bit more logical so I can see what's going on. Um, so we can fire up the HDMI uh, protocol analyzer. So this is a, if we come back to our web page, uh, okay, just let me switch my view here so I can see. Um, Agilent 5998A HDMI protocol analyzer. So we got our hands on one of these um, last year. So the. Um, uh, we wanted to get. Oh, it's not, let me show you what it is. It's just the, the manual for it. If we come down to eBay, probably just as good as any of pictures there. Um, so if you want to buy one of these things, uh, they are quite expensive to buy an HDMI protocol analyzer. And you can see at the moment uh, that someone wants four grand for one of these. Now the, the thing with the N5998A um, is it's so old now. Um, that they only work with Windows XP. So you actually have to install Windows XP on a virtual machine or do, uh, you know, or pull out, uh, you know, uh, if you've got old XP install media and you've got a product key and everything that can go with it. Um, you can, in theory, install a machine and set it up uh, and do it that way. Uh, and so if you wait around, you can get them quite cheap on eBay from time to time. So this one they're wanting $3,900. Um, that to me is uh, pretty expensive and interesting. It, it, this one's coming from Korea. Um, they were quite popular, it seems, uh, in Asia. So the one we got was from Japan, and it was they were decommissioning a um, like a, a, a test facility of some sort, and so we got it for maybe eleven hundred dollars Australian, including freight to the middle of the outback where we were at the time. Uh, and so that box is now mounted. Uh, in the rack next to me. So I'm going to turn the power on. So we might get a little bit more background noise from that. Uh, and I just have to, to move across to uh, to turn the power on for that. Uh, and then we'll fire up the software and, and show how it all works. So the things that matter for it, we have two cables. Um, one is HDMI, and so that will go into the, um, the device that we want to test. Uh, and then we've got USB, which will get us the, uh, the data uh, off of the, um, uh, get the communications protocol to the analyzer. And again, the age that it is, it's USB 2. Um, so it's a little bit um, uh, lethargic when we do the data transfers, as you see. 
Uh, so I need to untangle these cords a little bit. Okay, plug the USB into there. Now, so the trick is at the moment, if I hop across to that, here we are. So here it is running. So this is the video that's coming out of the uh, little HDMI uh, splitter. So I've got a monitor here so I can see what, uh, in front of me, what's on the, the Mega 65. And then the other one goes into the uh, the stream deck. Uh, so you can see here, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the display uh, from there. So I now need to unplug the video output, the digital video connector from the Mega 65. So that will go blank in a moment. Um, and I will plug this HDMI lead in so that's connecting it into the protocol analyzer. And uh, the protocol analyzer really it's actually is another FPGA. Um, in some ways, not that dissimilar to how we've set up the, uh, the Mega 65 board. It has HDMI out, uh, and it, but it also has an HDMI in that can be used for doing this protocol uh, testing. So if we now come across and if I bring up virtual box and we've got Windows XP uh, for that here and so I can start that up so that will chug away we can make the window bigger Yes, we know that because there's no software updates on um, uh, on Windows XP anymore, right? So, uh, and then which is the one that we want down here? It's and so get. <laughs> Poor Windows XP. Okay, so now we can start the HDMI evaluator. And I've already set up the USB passover into the virtual machine. So it's kind of funny, it comes up first as a, a Sony part. Uh, and then once you uh, connect that, then it suddenly becomes a Cypress easy USB thing because it's changing the, uh, the mode or the firmware on the USB device. Uh, so at this point we can start a capture now we have to check the select the general dot clock that we need uh, for the video mode so the video mode we're using through that the the, um, the Game Boy Color Core uses is actually 74 point something megahertz so it's just in this first range um, and that's all fine so we can tell it to do a capture and so this will fill up all of the RAM on this FPGA board with raw HDMI bits uh, off the stream. So I think there's, I think it's four gig of RAM that's on the uh, uh, the FPGA board, which again for you know, ten or twelve years ago was uh, a lot. So now that it's captured and it's in the FPGA board in the analyzer, we now have to tell it we want to put it onto. Uh, the computer, uh, the XP machine to analyze it. So it's actually going on a file share that's on my laptop because otherwise the, vert, uh, the um, disk image for XP keeps getting bigger uh, and filling up my hard disk. So we can do, uh, we'll just call it stream.cap, save. Uh, and we can tell it that we want to get, like a hundred megabytes will actually be stacked because this is a fairly low video mode. Uh, so I can tell it upload and again USB 2.0 uh, so this will come across quite quite slowly do, 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 do. so this is the, the point at which you get bored uh, every time okay so that's uploaded so now we can go across to the HDMI evaluator tab and we have to tell it which video mode it was being displayed. Now, 
I know from the top of my head that this uh, that the uh, Game Boy Color is using 720p uh, at 60 hertz actually. So check the 60 hertz version. Uh, we have to again choose that file name because you can kind of you can play back uh, things that you want. So we can test for full HDMI compliance and we also can tell it that we want to test audio because we know that this actually has audio uh, in there uh, and then we can actually just hit start oh except it's telling me we have no pixel clock so we'll go cancel and so down here we put the pixel clock so it's 74.25 ah come on 74250123 123 start and so now it will chug away and it actually is working through that capture, which will be a, a number of frames. We'll see how many frames, in fact, uh, as we go along. Uh, and basically analyzing it and checking whether the uh, the signals match the um, uh, the HDMI standard and the um, uh, for the video mode as well, that the video mode has the, you know, the, yeah, that's the, the high definition TV standard video modes, the CEC modes, that's the ones. Um, so, yeah, that will uh, chug through. And what have we got while we're waiting there? Yeah, USB 2 quite slowly says LGB. Yeah, <laughs> like the IEC 1541. Yeah, that, well, actually, given that the USB 2.0 should be able to do 40 mega second, and we only had 100 megabytes, it should have been two and a half seconds, but it was like, what, 25, 30 seconds? So, yeah, maybe Commodore wrote the transfer routines for this uh, analyzer as well. And uh, glad, Maurice, that you're enjoying the. Uh, uh, the radio parallax in the background it's um for those who don't know about radio parallax let me paste the link in here it is um radio-parallax.de uh, and they have uh, chip tune and game tune uh, inspired music uh, that's all uh, drm uh, and all the rest of it free streaming it, it, it's great it's just really enjoyable so we can see that in that 200 megabytes that there were um, 10 frames. So this is at 60 hertz. So this is one sixth of a second uh, was uh, 200 megabytes. And what's great is that these are all showing green. So we actually have a signal which is in complete compliance with the um, HDMI 1.4a uh, standard. So we can drill down in a frame and we can look at the tests uh, and it'll tell us whether we've got all of these different uh, conditions in this blasted window we can't resize which is a bit annoying and so again so here this is the audio right so it's saying that there are 200 audio sample packet, uh, sample packets per frame uh, and this would tell us if for example if the sample rate wasn't exactly what it should be uh, and indeed we had uh, that was a problem earlier on uh, in the development of this so having this protocol analyzer has actually been really really helpful uh, for the mega 65 uh, main core uh, and now also as we're porting uh, that the mystic cores and having this generalized framework uh, that sy202 and others are, uh, are putting together it's made it much much easier uh, to get it right because otherwise it, it will work with some uh, monitors and not with others and this is really really frustrating um, or it'll do weird things and the audio is dropping out uh, intermittently because the sample rate was wrong for example so yeah we can see there's all the different tests um, one of the, the, the cool party tricks you can actually do with this is we can actually use this to do a digital uh, image capture so if we go expert mode uh, expert mode select test IDs if we select them all let's see if I remember the right way to do this um, I think that's right what it will do it will decode a fr each frame and then it will show the frame to us and ask whether the frame is right so we can see here this is what it was showing at that time and so we can down here we can say is that correct yes or no we'll say yes that's correct next frame uh, and this is actually writing out bmp image files for each frame 
uh, as it runs the test as well. So um, if we needed to, uh, to really test the performance of, uh, uh, of something, uh, and you know, we want to check every frame and have it at full uh, video, uh, so there's no compression at this point, right? There, it's just BMPs of each raw frame as it's displayed. Uh, so um, that's a, a really nice kind of side benefit of having the, uh, uh, the protocol analyzer. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we thought it, the, the protocol analyzer had died uh, after transporting it back from the outback until uh, it's finished. Uh, and it wasn't working. So sometimes, it's a, again, it's a little bit of an old machine, right? Uh, you have to kind of do a capture and that first capture will be complete nonsense. Uh, and then you do a second capture and then that second capture uh, will work fine. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we've been using to test the, uh, the HDMI compliance of our digital video output. Uh, so if you turn off the audio part, then it's basically DVI uh, as well and that will so let's get rid of Windows XP. And hop back across. Oops. Leave that there on Hibernate. So let's you, you switch back across. So going down my uh, my list. Uh, here, I think the, the next one that we're going to talk about is a whole pile of cat herding that's actually gone on in the background. Uh, so the uh, a project like the Mega 65 has all sorts of people doing all sorts of things. Let's put in the, uh, the output from the Mega 65 again here so that we can uh, look at things on there Oops, in a moment. So I'm going to tip my... What have I done? I've destabilized life, the universe, and everything here. My uh, stand that holds the uh, camera over the keyboard deciding it wants to tip over. Um, I think we should be good now. Now, if the Mega 65 suddenly starts getting a lot closer, then you know the camera uh, has indeed uh, tipped over again. Watch the, uh, <laughs> the angle of that there. Uh, so the um, I need to put the correct SD card back in as well. Otherwise, it's not going to boot. So there's lots of um, uh, work in the background of keeping track of all of the uh, the bugs and things that we discover uh, as we're going through. Uh, and then kind of working through some of those and people uh, providing updated uh, documentation. And uh, yeah, so just all this kind of housekeeping. And so um, Goethe uh, in particular lately has been doing a whole pile of that, which we're actually really, really grateful for. Uh, and that makes a, a massive difference to, uh, uh, to the project uh, and helps us to close some of these things out. And so there's, uh, yeah, updated documentation and things that have uh, gone in. Cool. So back to the connection. Uh, see what we're doing again. Um, yeah, and so yeah, we just want to really say thank you to Goethe and to all the others in the background who are doing this kind of work. And so, if you're looking on at the Mega 65 project and thinking, oh, I wish I uh, had a machine, but I don't have a machine, but I, I love the project, I would love to get involved. There's lots of work, uh, fun work uh, that uh, you know you can kind of you know pitch in and uh, and get involved in and be part of the project uh, in a really helpful way that will help to bring it out sooner uh, and with the the best quality possible. So, yeah, really want to uh, encourage that. Yes, yeah, so Maurice is asking, um, are the SD cards hot swappable? Um, yes, they are. Ah, yes. And so Anton is telling me in the background. They're talking about the manual. Uh, the manual has now got over a thousand pages as of the uh, uh, the last typesetting of it. We've been kind of inching up there for a while now, uh, but that's a, a really nice milestone. Again, this is from a whole bunch of people. So we've got, uh, you know, it's a bit shifted, did a whole pile of the basic 10 documentation. Goethe has been working on uh, pulling in some of the, uh, the material that some other people have kind of uh, worked on to update for setting up 
with Vivado and being able to flash bit streams and all of those sorts of things. And so this really is, as the, uh, uh, the Kiwis would say, it's a team effort uh, that has got us to this point and that we now have, uh, you know, is uh, the, you know, a thousand odd pages of the, uh, that's not what I'm trying to get to, I'm trying to, I have actually got the, here's a guide here, I just need to close off a couple of windows on the side so I can see what I'm doing here. Um, yeah, so if you haven't already seen the Mega 65 user guide, uh, it is glorious. So we did a whole pile of work, and again, it was a, a team effort with a, a, a bunch of us working to make uh, a, it's a really fantastic looking uh, typesetting that is super reminiscent of the, uh, uh, the, you know, the early 80s. Uh, Commodore 64 and uh, Vic 20 and the like user guide. So we've got a uh, nice type of content. And so the PDF version is all hyperlinked. So we have the PDF version is the single huge volume. So that is a thousand odd pages. And we're planning to have the physical copies ring bound uh, with volumes covering different bits and pieces uh, out of it. So we can, you know, oops, if we look at the chapters, they also, again, just have that really nice Kind of look we've got these nice you know the nice tables and all the other kind of elements uh in there oh we need to make that table a bit narrower that's right we'll fix that so that it uh, it fits uh, properly uh yeah and so we can have uh, you know screen output or code listings and things in there and again we just really one of the things that we're really proud of uh, is how nice uh, the manual looks already uh, and it will keep getting uh, better yeah so, so shallon is Saying here, yes, truly lovely. My printed version is well thumbed uh, and now falling apart, uh, which is great. Just in time for a, an updated version that has, uh, yeah, more up to date information in there. It's actually part of the reason that he's thumbing through. If I go back up to the, uh, uh, to the beginning, so of course, Shannon's been doing a whole pile of coding and experimenting with things. So if we come down to, if we search for Vic Four, there's a whole chapter. Oops, yeah on I've lost it again now haven't I Vic 4 so chapter 13 is the Vic 4 video interface controller so if we jump down to that chapter again there's a lot of kind of work in progress in uh, these in that there is you know bits and pieces of information that's not finished in here uh, but at the same time there's already a pile of information here uh, that's super helpful. Just to make that a bit wider so that we can. 100% should be good. So it's a little bit easier for you to uh, uh, to see what's uh, on there. And if we come down, so yeah, we've got information about the overall uh, frame layout and all how that works and difference between PAL and NTSC because Mega 65s are. Um, ambidextrous in terms of video mode so they'll do uh, NTSC and PAL a bit like the Amigas you can switch it in software uh, and then we've got information on some of the funky uh, video modes and things so again this will be information that uh, Shalon have been going through and if we come down further we have tables of registers like we have used to in the uh, uh, the Mega 65 sorry the C64 uh, reference guide uh, so we've got uh, we start out here with the uh, the Commodore 64 common registers then it's and they're all uh, explained and then we have the new VIX-3 registers for the C65 so this is mostly around uh, some of the bit planes and some of the additional uh, registers and some of the registers have different meanings so for example the border color register is no longer four bits when you're using it as a VIX-3 it's an eight bit color so you can actually set the border color to any of 256 colors uh, and then we've got some of the, the bit plain things and the, the flags for selecting fast CPU, 640 pixel horizontal, uh, 400 pixel vertical, banking in different ROMs. So as well as the uh, the zero one, you know, the dollar zero one uh, register on the C64 that controls the ROM and I/O banking, 
the C65 and thus the Mega 65 also has these other ROM banks that can be switched in using this port, uh, this uh, register on the uh, the Big 3. Uh, and so that's all fine and good. And we have the, I think the, the color palettes are also listed in here. But then if we come down further, we now we get to all the fun new uh, Mega 65 ones. Again, we need to fix that table because it's over wide again as well. Um, but we can see that there's actually lots of new registers for the um, uh, the Vic 4. So there's lots of stuff here to um, uh, to work through. And yeah, as Shalom is saying, <laughs> these are the fun registers where you can do all sorts of crazy things. So you can kind of be like, what's this um, SPR tile N sprite tiling enable actually? So if we come down, that will actually have a little explanation here. So this is great to kind of read through and get ideas about things and then some of the rest of the text in the chapter talks about these things. Um, sprite, um, SPR tile in, sprite horizontal tile enables. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and so this lets you have a sprite and have it drawn not just once, but it will draw repeatedly across to the right hand edge of the screen. So you can have kind of, you don't mind having you know, like grass or waves or something in the background and have that draw all the way across effectively with an automatic horizontal uh, sprite multiplexer uh, just as one of example of one of the, the many things that the uh, uh, the Vic 4 can do uh, so that's uh, really fun so um, that's that side uh, and as I say so uh, Che and a, a number of others have been putting a lot of work into that uh, of late and other people have put work in at different times as well um, and one of the other things that's really nice is happening at the moment so BitShifter has been continuing to work on his improved versions of the uh, the c65 roms so in fact if we uh, come back over here this startup banner if you uh, if you haven't already noticed actually shows so it's it says commodore uh, 1991 uh, copyright if i move the cursor up uh, ah, what have i done my cursor has stopped blinking so People sitting in some I got the Okay. Right, so copyright 1991 Commodore and of course like the 128, the copyright 1977 Microsoft. And we have also now the uh, copyright 2021 Mega. Uh, because it has all of the uh, uh, the new changes in it. Um, Anton's actually just telling me that I'm behind the scenes. So is there a version 920188? So there's been 11 more commits uh, since uh, this went through. Uh, and the other nice thing you can see here, so my real-time clock is clearly not running on this at the moment. Uh, oh no, sorry, it is. Of course it doesn't tick because it gets drawn. Um, so it shows the current date and time uh, on here. Oh, sorry, yes, 21 commits, as I'm saying, not uh, whatever few that I said. Um, so BitShifter has been doing fantastic work. So the, the copy and the backup commands now support um, multiple uh, drives. And yeah, there's a whole bunch of just, as we go through, people kind of pick out kind of usability issues and performance issues and bugs. Uh, and BitShifter has been doing an amazing job of responding to those often you know, within a, a few hours uh, to fix the assembly code in the source. Uh, so he's actually recreated an assembler that can assemble the original Commodore source code for the C65 ROM to produce these uh, updated ROMs. Now, unfortunately, we can't share these ROMs uh, in their kind of natural state because of the copyright parts from Commodore and Microsoft in there. Uh, but we have a couple of different tools that let us share diffs uh, between the newest ROMs and uh, a particular version of the, uh, uh, the ROMs from 1991 because our changes aren't copyright by anyone other than us, so we can distribute those. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's all uh, coming along nicely. Um, it's probably also worth at this stage uh, mentioning that XEMU has now got uh, initial support for Sprite Collision, uh, which was a, a bit of a, uh, you know, something that had been missing for a while because it's actually quite tricky to do with good performance in an emulator because you have to check all the sprite positions and uh, and it's you know it's pixel by pixel uh, comparison so it's yeah it's quite 
uh, challenging to do in a way that runs quickly and the Mega 65 already requires a fair bit of juice to emulate because it's such a powerful 8-bit machine. Uh, so uh, LGB has been doing some great work on that with um, Hernand uh, as well. Uh, and so that's all really nice. Uh, and then what we also have happening that's making use of that improved XEMU is Shallon has the, uh, uh, the competition for this month. So if you have a hop over to, um, uh, to Shallon's, uh, either to his uh, Twitch, so twitch.tv slash Shallon50k. Shallon can pop the URLs uh, in the channel since we know he's on and, uh, and, uh, and watching. And you have the chance again to win a, a development kit for the Mega 65. So this is using one of the Nexus uh, DDR boards that can run the Mega 65 core uh, and we provide bit streams for those on an ongoing basis uh, and the challenge for this month is to write uh, remind me Shallon it's to write a game using Millifork which is this kind of mid-level language uh, that lets you uh, you know code for uh, 6502 type systems a little bit more easily uh, and hopefully Shallon will pop the, uh, the link to the competition in there uh, so yeah just really encourage anyone to uh, uh, to hop in uh, and take part in in these competitions because you can win hardware that will let you uh, play around with the Mega 65 before the final machine comes out. Uh, and that hardware is uh, essentially funded by uh, a number of really generous people who are supporting Challenge uh, through Twitch and through other ways to have the funds to be able to buy those boards uh, and set them up uh, to give out. So, yeah. It, I love the way that the Mega 65 community is just really generous with one another uh, and pitches in, uh, you know, financially with time, with encouragement, uh, just in so many ways. Uh, it makes the you know, this community just such a joy to work with. Uh, which I mean, because at the end of the day, we, we wanted to have fun doing retro, geeky, nerdy, 8-bit Commodore-y kind of stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, I love uh, doing that with this this really positive. Community, so it's it's fantastic. Uh, okay, cool. So Shalom's just pasted the uh, the link in uh, to the Discord channel, uh, and once we have this on YouTube, we'll have to put some of those uh, in the comments below as well. So hopefully they're there for you now. Um, so that's really good. So speaking of uh, of Shalon and the skullduggery that he's been up to, um, one of the things that he's been working on uh, of late. Is it, why is that? Keyboard's not being responsive on there for some reason. But I've got it. You know, I had the lid off all the time on this, so it's uh, it's possible that it's just sitting strangely on something and, uh, and slightly shorting out. That's behaving better now. Mostly, and the cursor has disappeared again. Hmm. Something strange. Um, I don't think I've got anything. Else. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but what is of interest to us now is that um, Shallon has been working on um, a Mode 7 type engine for the Mega 65. So, Mode 7 is the um, was it a mode for now? Was the SNES originally? Uh, was it Shallon that it uh, first appeared on? And it was this kind of tricky way to give to do fake uh, 3D perspective. So it was used for the like the initial Mario Kart type games, um, even though the hardware didn't support true 3D. Uh, and so if we if I, let's see if I can get the I have the tab here. Yeah, we should be able to get this across. Yeah, right. So, in terms of how it works, so this nice JavaScript test engine that uh, Shalom put together, uh, and so we can do WASD. So we can see at the top there we have the uh, the view uh, moving around the um, uh, the track, and we can kind of move. So you get this idea this sense of uh, you know a, a 3d perspective uh, going on and if you look in the bottom part of the display you can actually see 
it's drawing a black line across where it's sampling from the map to draw each line of the display so it draws each raster is actually grabbed from one of these black lines so it's sampling across the map so it needs we need an efficient way to read across there um, and then to scale it drawing it out to stretch it uh, to the appropriate width to fill here so if we change dynamically for example the field of view if we make the field of view wider we can see that we're we're getting larger slabs of data uh, from that uh, than if we had the uh, uh, the narrow yeah so it was something it's literally the seventh mode uh, on the SNES since so we've got uh, links there uh, as well which are great uh, and so again if we make the field of view narrower we can see that they're getting smaller pieces and so we can see there's much more horizontal exaggeration going on so to make it look good you have to kind of pick values that look kind of sensible uh, and so likewise the horizon is kind of artificially chosen to be at a point that makes it look about right uh, but of course it can uh, be varied as well and we can kind of make it chunkier to save uh, times of the vertical resolution dropping here is having less lines in there you can see as i'm changing that the number of lines that are appearing in there uh, is more or less because if we drop the vertical resolution then we can save raster time to draw the um, uh, the display uh, and then we can you know, see where the uh, you know the, the black lines are getting picked from and the direct effect that this is having on the um, uh, the display Oops. You have to ask uh, Shallon exactly what some of the other uh, twiddly knobs on here are. So that uh, JavaScript engine was helpful to get the right parameters to make something that looks reasonable. Uh, but then Shallon has been uh, of late, and I think again, uh, maybe not tonight on your stream, but I think uh, uh, normally a couple of times a week at the moment uh, has been working on uh, this engine on this stream so again hop on to uh, uh, to Shallon's stream at twitch.tv slash Shallon 50k and you can follow along as he's actually producing this thing but uh, enough talking about it let's actually have a look at it uh, so try not to tip my keyboard camera over here uh, what disk have I got in there okay so that's the wrong disk so I'll go into the freeze menu zero to Choose Eternal Drive, mode 7.d81. Right, there's the file there. So shift run stop to load it. And again, with our trusty, faithful, chunky joystick, we can see. Now, so this is still very much a work in progress. But you can see he's got it drawing at full frame rate and uh, the border is showing the um, uh, the drawing of it. Again, the, the, something clearly screwed something up with the machine here at the moment. Might be that might be running a funny bit stream or something um, where it's pausing intermittently. But you can see when it is running, the um, it's taking what about a fifth of the screen uh, in raster time to draw all of that. So this is quite frankly, amazing what he's actually managed to do already. And so uh, you can see there's, you know, there's things where it needs to be improved uh, with the close up zoom. But again, when it's actually moving, uh, it will look better as well. And so, yeah, this is continuing to uh, evolve nicely. Now, the way that this works on the Mega 65, again, if you remember what we had on the, um, uh, the display, uh, there before of you know, showing those lines. So we've actually added the DMA controller now has support for uh, not only line drawing, but if you like line copying. So you can give it the, um, uh, the slope and uh, starting point of a line and tell it to, to read bytes from along that path. So you can actually read pixels out of the, um, a flat map display uh, and copy them to somewhere in memory and then separately after that, you do another DMA job that does the uh, the scaling like we did in Mega Maze, um, that can effectively do texture scaling. So it can say, read that n number of bytes and scale it to the full width of the screen. Uh, and so that's what's happening here uh, in real time. 
uh, at full frame rate. So this is, we're in power, so this is 50 frames a second. Uh, and we can, again, you know, wait. I'm just gonna try and load a different newer bit stream because I reckon this is using a, uh, a wonky bit stream. Because we'll need the new bitstream anyway for what we're going to show you in a moment. I just need to decompress the bitstream because I was running out of disk space earlier today, so I b zipped all of my bitstreams because I keep all of the uh, the old bitstreams in case I need to go back and do regression investigations on where something has gone wrong. Hoping that this bitstream won't have this strange pause problem. Okay. Yep, that seems to have got rid of it. So it's just a funny bitstream. Because it, it's already it's really nice. It's going to see if I can actually kind of drive around the track in some sensible of way and so you know you it really does give this impression that we are driving around the track uh, so i think one of the things that shun's hoping to do as well is to uh, to stick the map um, up into the eight megabyte expansion attic ram um, which will allow more space to make the map be a, a higher resolution version of the map which will also help to to reduce a, you know a number of these kind of artifacts that we're seeing uh, with all of this so yeah, it's really nice. So again, um, watch Shallon Streams uh, for much more information about how he's doing it. Um, and I think you already uploaded a video to uh, talking about that. And so again, in the uh, the, uh, the the chat here, uh, talking about uh, some of the ways with some folks asking about how to do it. So the um, yeah, it's really really nice. Really, absolutely looking forward to seeing what can be produced uh, with this mode. So yeah, that's super fantastic. So um, talking about having loaded from floppy, so the, what I've been working on uh, in the last while is actually getting uh, floppy formatting uh, and uh, working because we've had the floppy drive in the Mega 65 has been able to read for a very long time now, but what we haven't been able to do uh, is to write to the floppy drive. So we have a real floppy drive. I'm just gonna, again, I'll move the uh, cover off the keyboard. So you can see a little bit of what we have going on here. So for my test rig, so we've got the floppy drive, and instead of the normal single uh, connector cable, I've dug out from an old PC in the shed, uh, one that has two. And the reason for that is then I can stick probe pins into where the other drive would go. Uh, and then I've got my oscilloscope probes down here connected to those. Uh, so on my oscilloscope, which unfortunately we can't uh, show on camera, uh, so I could see you know, whether I had the right signals and things going on uh, with that. And of course we have the actual, uh, the real uh, floppy drive uh, here going on. I really need to stick some kind of weight on that uh, or it's gonna tip over on me. Let's we'll get something after. Um, so, if we come back here, indeed, floppies. I completely agree, Maurice. I think that having a real floppy drive is one of the things that, for me, makes the Mega 65 really a real computer. Uh, that it's not just off SD card. It's not just a uh, you know a, a, an emulation and recreation. It is one with the hardware and so of course we have the IEC expansion port, we have the cartridge port, all of these things uh, work together uh, and yeah so it's really nice. So if I come across to here, so what I, as I was kind of implementing uh, things I needed a way to test what was going on so I've been modifying the floppy test uh, .c program in the Mega 65 tools repository and been progressively adding uh, additional features. Uh, so if we go through some of these, so obviously we can, if I most simply number two, test reading all sectors. 
So if the disk is formatted, uh -huh, um, then this should actually be showing green on all of those things. So I'm actually, I'll stop that. And so I added a test routine into format. So this is now going to format the entire disk. And I don't know whether you can hear the drive ticking. Try and move the, uh, the microphone over for a moment. you could kind of hear the uh, uh, the drive uh, ticking away there a bit and again having the real drive and having it uh, tick and make noise uh, when you're using it uh, is just again one of those things that's just really nice it gives that really uh, you know real machine feel so even when you load from a, um, a disk image from the SD card the drive will spin and tick uh, because we actually the, the floppy controller and the SD controller actually are one uh, big thing and uh, they know uh, what's going on when you're, you're accessing. So, uh, so uh, burp, 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 burp. Uh, Anton's asking, can we, so assume we can use it as a copy station? Yes, you'll be able to use it as a copy station soon. Um, and uh, so Maurice is saying, stupid question, but do you encounter different issues with pre-formatted floppies compared to brand new unformatted ones? Um, I haven't noticed any differences there. Uh, but one of the things that we can do, and I'll, I'll show you uh, in a moment, the, this option six on the menu, wipe disk. Um, this is something that's very hard to do with a regular PC, but we can basically wipe the magnetic media just by turning the right head on and not changing anything over the whole track. So it doesn't actually write any bits, it just erases and puts a, a constant magnetic signal. So now in theory, if everything is going well, if I tell it number two to read sectors. Ah, so why is it not? Reading anything, I've fluffed something up here. So, as you, so what you can see at, at the bottom of the screen here, this is um, sectors under head. Uh, we've got the uh, the track sector and head. So actually, there are sectors on there, but the head number is opposite uh, to what it's expecting. So there's uh, this is a funny little problem uh, I've been having. So now, of course, it's got through that first side of the first thing uh, and it's all working fine um, and it will probably actually reread that track fine when it gets back there so I need to find out it might be that there's some funny uh, bug with the, the seeking or having the head select on the wrong side of the first time round or something uh, to investigate uh, and what we'll actually also see is so uh, track dollar 4f is track 79 and so they start at zero uh, but there's actually these five extra tracks at the end on the on the far right so just to the left of my <laughs> i've got no spatial sense of where this is so so just down here that's actually tracks 80 to 84 or rather 81 to 85 if you want to number them from one like a pc does um so we can actually format 85 tracks uh with the real drive uh, and that's working which is kind of fun um so um, Anton's asking, how does it look in regards to HD uh, versus DD floppy? So 1.44 meg versus 720s. Um, the, it, we actually have a high density drive in the Mega 65. So the, uh, the drive you can see here is a standard 1.44 uh, PC floppy drive, uh, partly because that's all we could get in quantity, uh, but actually it just makes sense to have it as kind of uh, more standard. Uh, and so, that means that we actually do have the means to read high density disks. And so I have already uh, tested that with high density disks uh, before. Uh, and all you have to do is to change the data rate uh, from 500 kilobit to one megabit. Uh, and then it will start picking up the, uh, uh, the high density disk sectors. Uh, and so we'll be able to write to high density disks as well. Um, and in fact, our controller design will work with the extended density, so 2.88 meg uh, disks and drives. Um, if you can find one, uh, we've, we've managed to get hold of a couple so that we can kind of test. The media is outrageously expensive to get hold of. We think in practice that just high density is actually all that really matters. And um, one of the things that um, uh, I'm intending to do uh, with that is actually to experiment with higher density formats. Actually, so Challenge is saying, do we have a virtual format for 1.44 meg, .d144s? Um, so 
it will actually be the, the FD2000 format um, is what we will likely use, uh, the, the, the CMD uh, high density drives. And one of the, the interesting things I discovered with that as I was looking at it recently, um, is that they, when they went to the high density, they didn't double the number of sectors, they actually doubled the size of the sectors. Uh, so I actually need to rejig our controller a little bit uh, and our memory buffering so that we can actually have a one kilobyte sector buffer uh, and read in uh, those double sized sectors. Uh, which would be cool. But I think it's actually possible on a 720K disc to get nearly two megabytes of data um, if we use um, all of the kind of uh, things at our disposal uh, rather than doing it the uh, you know the inefficient PC way. We already know like the 720s on a PC were 720, there were 800K on a 1581, and so on the C65, the 800K. Uh, the Amiga got 880K, uh, but we can actually do better than that. Because yeah. uh, the, the Amiga gets 880K by writing a track at once. So the gaps between the sectors can be very small because it doesn't have to worry about turning the head on at the right time. Uh, and that takes a, a little bit of time for it to switch on uh, and then write the, uh, the sector. And of course, it might be a little bit out. It might be a bit faster, a bit slow. So it might take more or less space. So there's kind of this big uh, you know, slop factor uh, of about 30% uh, uh, on the disk. Uh, you know, between the sectors. So the um, uh, we can get rid of that if we do track at once uh, writing. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Uh, but we could also actually switch from MFM to GCR like the 1541 used. So MFM needs uh, one and a half magnetic flux transitions on average um, per bit. I'm, I'm simplifying things here a little bit. Um, but GCR, like on the 1541, it needs 1.2. So 1.5 divided by 1.2 is 5 over 4. We can get an extra 25% uh, capacity by using 1541 style GCR. Uh, but if it actually, you can use a 1716 uh, RLL code, which is kind of like GCR and steroids. It writes two bytes using 17 bits. Uh, and that also kind of, uh, you know, will work uh, and so that basically can get you down to 1.05 uh, instead of 1.2 magnetic flux transitions per bit so we can get fly really close to the wire uh, in that regard and we can basically have one giant sector on every track and we can probably also increase the data density a little bit certainly we can vary the data density by track like the 1541 does uh, but again with the mega 65 controller we can actually smoothly change that data rate uh, on every track if we want to. Um, so we just have a, we divide the 40.5 megahertz system clock uh, by some number uh, to get the data rate. So we divide by 81 on a 720K disc, we divide by uh, 40 uh, on a 1.44, uh, but so we could be dividing by, you know, uh, by 81, by 80, by 79, 78, 77, uh, you know, as we go get to the outer tracks uh, on a 720 to fit more bits on the track. Uh, and so kind of back of envelope calculations, we should be able to get anywhere between you know 1.2 and 2 megabytes on a 720K disk if we made a funky format for that. Uh, and so demos and games and things could use such a funky format themselves if they wanted to. Um, now in terms of the name for the FD2000 uh, floppy images, there already is, I think it's .d2d. Uh, if you Google around, you'll be able to, uh, to find them. So, yeah, so LGB, you're, you're quite right that the Amiga writes a track at once so that the sector gaps are still there, but they're much, much smaller. Uh, and that's how they got 880. So they could get 11 sectors per track instead of uh, the nine on a PC or the 10 that a 1581 does. Um, so absolutely, we'll be able to read um, Amiga and Atari ST floppies uh, in the Mega 65. In fact, it, it's already actually possible to read Amiga floppies uh, and things uh, with a bit of fiddling. But the Atari ST ones are basically PC format anyway, so uh, so they'll be quite easy to um, uh, to do. So if I come back out uh, here. Um, so other things that I added in. Uh, here we've got uh, option six, this is this magnetic flux wipe. So if I do that on the disc, uh, it will chuck its way through. And this is removing all trace 
uh, of structure on the disk. Uh, so again, if we do this, and then if we uh, go back over to the um, uh, that uh, all disk sector read test, um, it will just it won't find anything uh, anywhere. So Shalon is saying that yeah, being able to, to read and actually also to write Amiga and ST uh, disks. Yeah, that will really make those emulators like we're doing with the Mega 65, right? Of having the, um, well, they're not emulators, they're a core. Um, so the machine will able to be an Amiga and the drive will tick <laughs> the way that it should on an Amiga and all of those sorts of things as well. Um, so yeah, so that's again, one of the really nice things of having the, the real hardware. So uh, you'll be able to use a Mega 65 as uh, a real Amiga uh, in the future, uh, all going well. So now if we go back to the read test, now that we've wiped the entire disk, so not only this first side or the first track uh, will fail, the, the entire disk uh, will fail. And you can actually see, so down at the bottom, right, if I, uh, so just to the right of, where's my, so <laughs> up here, uh, we can see now that it's no longer ticking, showing the sectors that it's finding. So it's stuck saying that the last thing it saw was on track dollar 54 so that was at the end of the disc sector 9 um, side 1 uh, because the disc has been completely and utterly wiped so we won't sit there waiting with that what we'll do now is we will boot back up into basic 10 and we can use the mega 65 basic the, you know, the, the Commodore Basic 10 um, header command, which we header. So if we want to format a disk in basic 10, we don't have to do any of this uh, open 15, blah, 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 blah stuff. Um, yep, so hang on, it's quite right. I need to switch to the internal drive, which I'll do in a moment. Um, but we can issue a command like this to format the disk. So the key is if we need to do a low level format, so we have to do the comma I and an ID number. Um, and we have the disk name in quotes. So let's hop across. Go into the freeze menu, choose internal drive on uh, the first drive. Now, if I was to try and do a, a DIR here, um, it should do it and it should hopefully time out with a, a 74 drive uh, not ready error. Um, again, it depends a bit on what bit streaming things and there's some imperfections here, so it might actually just be hanging, which this is fine. We can uh, we'll just reset. But anyway, you can see that the, uh, there's absolutely no oops, formatted disk available to this. So now if we do header, test, ID, 65, as we can. Ah, now so the other thing that we need to do as well here, so we have a little bug. Uh, there's a... I'm pretty sure it's a bug in the CPU timing on the Mega 65. I reckon it might be with the branch instructions where it's running slightly too slow. And that's actually just enough to upset the uh, format routine in the, uh, the C65 DOS. And I've got a, a bug with the, uh, the freeze menu at the moment that I need to, uh, to fix. So it might just have to do a We can, it's going to set 40 megahertz mode. Do it this way. From in the uh, uh, the matrix mode. Right. So now we've forced 40 megahertz. We can actually see that now that we're in the, the freeze menu, it's showing 40. Select the internal drive. And this will just make sure that the CPU isn't going so slow that it kind of causes this uh, problem formatting. Because the format routine actually is a bit like the you know the the, uh, the Commodore machines with the video chip. You're racing the raster line um, to display things. So the format routine is actually racing the drive head. Um, it doesn't tell it just to 
platform out of sector, it actually just, or the track, it actually just says, turn on the right head, and I'm going to feed you bytes, and you need to write those bytes out to the disk. And so if they're late, uh, you get extra bits and things inserted that shouldn't be there. So now I can hit, uh, say yes, we want to start formatting, and you will see the screen goes blank, because again, it knows that it has to erase the, uh, uh, the, uh, the head, and you can hear the drive ticking again. And so this will chug through, so it's formatting both sides and uh, take a, a little while to, uh, to go. Um, but it's actually, with the C65 DOS, with the original ROM, it is formatting uh, the disks, uh, which is really, really nice. Uh, so, but at the moment we have disk formatting working, but we don't have sector writing working. Uh, so that we will need to, uh, uh, that's the next thing I'm actually working on at the moment, in fact. Uh, so the format, we will format the disk correctly, but the directory structure won't get populated because it can't write over those sectors to put the, uh, you know, the BAM and the header block and all of those sorts of things in there. Um, so we'll, we will get an error at the end, uh, a read error, uh, in fact, that basically says that it's got confused uh, at the end. Hopefully that will finish fairly quickly. And so actually I'm hoping that the um, getting the, the sector writing won't take that much more work to do now. Now that we've got the, um, uh, the formatting working, uh, that's actually the hard bit because it's the whole the ability for us to write bytes onto the, um, uh, the tracks on the floppy uh, and verify that they're uh, uh, correct. And so, uh, again, in that uh, that program, there was an option to uh, to read a, a track raw. So this, as I say, you can actually use this now to write a utility that runs, uh, you know, in C64 or C65 mode on the Mega 65. That could actually read Amiga disks uh, because it would be able to do this raw capture of the, uh, the track and do the decoding itself. A little bit like we saw with the HDMI, HDMI protocol analyzer, right? You, you do a capture and then you can decode it in software after. A little bit slow, uh, but it would work. Right, and so it's finished. And so it's formatted all 80 tracks. So remember uh, that before when we ran the, uh, the test program, that it was showing no sectors even existed because we'd wiped them with the flux thing. Now we've formatted so they should be back there. And it's a little bit fun if we do a, a directory because it could, uh, can't write the correct data into the, um, uh, the sectors. This is kind of rubbish in there, whatever the, the format puts in by default, which I'm not sure. Uh, and so we get this kind of garbled directory on there. But again, this is a clue that we actually have data uh, on there. So if we now load up our test program again. And we tell it test all sectors on disk, number two. Now again, this is a funny thing with the, the first side on the first track I need to try and find out I think it's just selecting the wrong uh, side of the disk initially yeah uh, or am I selecting the wrong side of the disk altogether because that's got so it's saying that it can see head one it's interesting so when it gets through, reading the 10 sectors. Yeah, I reckon I've got the, um, uh, in this program, I think I'm choosing the, uh, the wrong side of the disk. So let me, might be able to do a quick fix on that. read all sectors so there's the tracks and then we're choosing which side ah okay there's the problem yeah so we had so previously um we weren't checking the um uh, the side field in the the uh the controller because for some reason that 
was causing trouble but I've fixed that bug in the last week or two so now we do check so now I actually need to instruct the floppy controller to check that and I need to do so the 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 logical side and the physical side is actually swapped on a 1541 so I need to invert that so it's looking for head one on side zero and head zero on side one right that's got that working now so the other thing if you astute you notice it's actually it's reading slower with the disk that's been formatted by the c65 dos and that's because the c65 dos formats the disk with a skew factor of seven so it writes sector one then it writes sector seven uh, and then it counts seven on from that, which would be 14, but there's only 10, so that will be uh, four. So it's one, seven, four, 10. So it's kind of, it's staggered around. So it takes more revolutions of the disc to read all of the sectors uh, than this test program that I wrote actually just does it with a skew factor of one, actually. Uh, and then the, the read program actually reads with a, a, uh, an interleave factor of two. Um, so there's this whole kind of, you know, the real issues around the way that disks work uh, in there. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Anton, you were trying to get my attention before about uh, asking whether I was on the internal drive, uh, which I think, yes, we are, because we've kind of gone through this whole uh, kind of process. So, um, yeah, so... This, uh, I was actually really pleased we kind of got to this point of being able to um, uh, to format disks uh, because it is it's the, the hard part uh, towards us getting to have the drive fully fully alive uh, and yeah hopefully maybe in the next couple of weeks I'll be able to uh, get the uh, the sector writing working and in theory I already have the code there to do it um, and I actually need to uh, to debug what's going wrong when we try and do it. Uh, so the, the tool I've created for that, again, in this utility, we have read a raw track. Uh, so I'm going to make a, um, uh, so again, uh, option seven, in fact, sector right testing. I'm going to set that up uh, when I've implemented that so that I can tell it that I want to write a certain data pattern to a particular sector, uh, and then actually be able to read it back and see what is there versus what's not. Uh, and if it complains about sector errors because of somehow writing things in a rubbish way that isn't valid, uh, then being able to do the read raw track uh, will let me uh, uh, get the um, uh, you know that raw data and actually see exactly what's been written to the disk, the actual waveform, uh, and find out what's wrong uh, and debug it that way, as I've done with the, the complete uh, disk formatting uh, side of things. So, yeah, um, it's half past midnight here, <laughs> and uh, a work day for me today uh later in the day so i might wrap it up at that point unless anyone's got any quick burning questions that they'd love to um uh, to, to dig in um, and i'll quickly try and answer but otherwise that's a, a bit of an update of some of the things that have been going on in june uh with the mega 65 so yeah hopefully that's been uh, enjoyable and interesting for folks and um yeah we'll catch you around next time and yeah and hop on you know in how many what time is your Stream going on, Shallon? It's a few hours' time from now, right? Six or seven hours or something, I reckon. Five and a half hours from now. Yep. Cool. So, yeah. Um, tune in there and uh, and get some more Mega 65 8-bit goodness uh, as Shallon works on stuff. And, uh, yeah. We'll uh, catch you all around. See ya.